Well, good morning to you. It's been quite a week for uh, for many in our church body. I know you've been praying for one another, and thank you for that. We had Mar Maria Studebaker, one of our shepherd's wives. Uh, mom went to be with the Lord and uh, this week, and uh, we had another man in our church, uh, Larry Day, who uh, broke a rib, and, and so we've been praying for him. And uh, you don't know how blessed I feel to have Stan Vanderhoff up here playing uh, the bass up here, and uh, Sam and him back. And, he was uh, in the hospital, I think, 12 days, more than ready to go home, but he's home again after uh, an in-depth surgery, and I believe the pathology report was no cancer present on the spleen, was all, you know, all, all the things that were uh, pancreas um, taken out, and, and, um, and so just continue to be in prayer for, for these that are the things going on. And Jim Lydicote uh, had a good surgery on Thursday on his ankle and foot, he was in the first service this morning, and so those are going well, and I also have a special guest here. My mother-in-law, uh, Myrna, is here, and I know a lot of you prayed for her uh, this last summer, going before going through surgery. So, honored guests, uh, my father-in-law Russ and mother-in-law Myrna are here, and uh, we're glad she's doing uh, much better and after her surgery this summer. And uh, so, always be praying for each other. There's always battles going on and, and uh, things needing to, to be taken care of, and so we lift each other up in the prayer ministry and take those things before the Lord and, and where we can. We meet needs. Uh, Linda Morton's, you know, lost her husband just two weeks ago, and, and uh, we're thankful he came to know the Lord this last year, but she's, uh, you know, lost her life mate of 50 years, and suddenly that person's gone, not there anymore, and so there's ways to need to minister to, to Linda and um, reach out to her and, and um, just, just uh, meet each other's needs, something about ministry, and really that's what the series that we started last week is about, about being be in the hands and feet of Christ. Be in the body of Christ. Be in the hands and feet. And, and, and ministering the church at its best is, is, is what we're going to talk about this morning. We're in the second week of this series uh, of being in the hands and feet and meeting needs in the church. So the world will see this great example of this compassionate and loving and care meeting and people that are so loving towards each other that the world will look and say, wow, look at that. Look how they treat each other. Look how they meet needs. It's not a group that hugs and kisses on each other a lot, but they, they show love by meeting needs. That's how ministry, ministry means to meet needs, and, it's, and then that's how you share love and care and concern for one another. And, and Christ said that that would be actually the way that people would be able to recognize you as his followers. They'll know you are my disciples by your love for one another. And so ministry is love for one another, meeting needs within the body of Christ. And some of you might say, you know, I'm, you're here in the room, and you're thinking, you know, I'm nice to other Christian people, Alan, and, and, and I even attend church services. You know, I, I come to church service, and I even talk to people while I'm here, you know, and, and and I would say, you know, that falls short a little bit of what the word ministry means and setting the example of that. It's also more than just, you know, giving advice or even spiritual advice to people or preaching to people. Some people still think ministry, well, that we, go, we go to church and the, the pastor preaches at us. And, and so he's doing the ministry of the church. He's just preaching and talking to us. And I say it even goes beyond that. I guess there was a 10-year-old telling his parents that he wanted to be a minister, a preacher. And his parents were kind of overjoyed with that and said, wow, how did you come to that conclusion? Or how did you come to that decision? And he said, well, it's real simple. He said, I figured I was going to have to go to church on Sundays anyway, and I'd rather be the person that hollers at everybody instead of the people that have to sit and listen. And so that was, and they said, whoa, well, not, maybe, maybe that's not the best reason for getting into ministry. But the Bible says in our commitment, or when we're talking about ministry, it says this in 1 John three sixteen through 18, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for br our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. But you say that describes our, our church as, as people that love through actions. We also bring the truth of the gospel. We certainly don't want to just meet people's needs and not share about the love of Jesus with them. But are we a people of action? So I, I sometimes I think about where my Christian uh, life is most practiced. In light of our, our vision at Fairfield Baptist, we gather, we grow, and we go. And I'm in light of that, where do I spend most of my time? Where does most of my energy go to as a Christian? And I would say, you know, I'm pretty comfortable gathering together in worship. I, I love being here. I love the, the music and the worship, and I just love being here with you folks. And so it's not, you're the, the, my, my most favorite people. 
And so I love gathering together. And sometimes for Christians, it's hard to get away from the Lord's table because it's so comfortable here. You know, some of the best people on earth, I think, are, 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 are right here in the church. And, it, and it's comfortable and it's loving. And I love how you treat each other. I love being with you. And so I love gathering. And I actually love growing. You know, I love reading my Bible. And I love studying it. And I love getting together to grow with other people in the study of the Word. And I love that. And some of you might say, well, that's better than a lot of Christians. You know, from what we're, studies are saying, you know, we're seeing a lot of people don't read their Bibles. And even Christians aren't reading their Bibles that much. And I said, well, last year, that's why we focused all year on anchoring deep. It was a discipleship year. But if we just did that... We're still falling short of our whole church vision because we gather together in worship and we do grow in the word of God. But we just don't just grow and we just don't gather. We're actually charged at this church with going, with going and go. Go to the people, go to, to your friends, go to them and, 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 and meet a need. It's ministry and it's outreach. And I think even if you took a survey of all our journey groups, and the reason why the shepherds, we changed those names to a journey group is because we'd hope it would, it would give a picturesque in the name of, a, of going. It's a journey. So uh, go and not just be a, a Bible study group, not just be a fellowship group, but be a going group that meets needs, that's, that's doing something out in the community, that's, that's I mean, a hurt or, or someone, you're, you're helping with someone with their yard, you're helping an elderly with their, their getting them to their medications or their pharmacy, or you're, you're helping with the Eugene Mission, with the soup kitchen, you're, you're helping in some way, and so it's, it's a journey. And the Christian life should be a journey. There should be action with actions and in truth. But I think if you took a survey of our journey groups around the 12 or so that are meeting and, and gathering together, you say, well, how many Bible studies have you had this, this fall into the winter? And will you be heavy on Bible studies and heavy on fellowships? And if my guess is right, and if it's like a lot of our groups, we would be a little light on the ministry nights when we went out or the visitation, the outreach nights. And that's pretty typical uh, of the church. And that's why we would spend a whole year talking about being the hands and feet of Christ because it's not natural to it. It's not something we're just naturally going to go out and do because we'd rather gather and we'd rather grow. But the Bible tells us all through his word we also need to go. There was a special time in the early church where there was a fantastic description of needs being met, a vibrant ministry happening throughout this church. It's recorded in Acts chapter 2. It's right after the miracle of Pentecost. And of course the church is, is vibrant and the church is taken off. The church, everything is new and fresh. The Holy Spirit comes upon the church at Pentecost and people start speaking in different languages. They're singing tongues of fire, you know, coming down. And it's like, whoa, this is exciting to be with this group. It's a good time to be in church that day. And so uh, Peter begins to preach and explaining a lot of things going on and stuff. And the church is just taken off. And in, in Acts 2, 44 through 45, it says, All the believers were together and had everything in common. And they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. It's like, wow, the church is just starting. And look how they're, they're, they're meeting needs. And, and you can see it's a special time. It's a miraculous time. It's just miraculous. All the believers were together and had everything in common. I can tell you as a pastor, that right there is miraculous. All the believers were together and everything in common. Are you kidding me? Wow. God must have been doing a, a work, just that level of unity and, and, and fellowship there. And then they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Selling property, that's, that's expensive gifts. And, there, and, and so there's some resources being poured into this new movement, this new body. And, there's, and, and it says everybody's needs are being met as they come up. Wow, a unique time period in the church history. There's some, maybe some even com com communal living and some protection from the outside forces that are coming against the church and things. So maybe it's a unique time, but there's a spirit of unity, love, and ministry going on there. Well, we know whenever things are rolling in the church, it's going to attract the attention of the enemy. Whenever things are going so well for the church and souls are being won, won, won to Christ, and that was what was happening in Jerusalem. And so early on, the Jerusalem church begins to get heavy persecution from outside. And when the church is reaching souls for Christ, you can bet there's going to be some tension or possible fractions in the church stirred up by the enemy from the inside that either distract the church or slow it down. And after the church, how often the church runs into trouble when people get their eyes off Jesus and others and begin to focus on themselves. 
That's always at the heart of when the church starts struggling or the distractions or the slowdown comes. I'm, I'm thankful this church, we, we gave another plaque to, from the Northwest Baptist Convention. We gave it to Jim Krieg and our evangelism coordinator just a few weeks ago at a meeting that said that this church was, again, one of the highest uh, churches in baptisms, second year in a row. I was like, wow, God is moving. God is baptizing people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and teaching them all that God commanded us to, 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 to do and, and be. It's like, wow, that's exciting, and it's fired up, but you know there's going to be some tensions. You know there's going to be people that take their eyes off Jesus and put up more on themselves and not so much on others, and, and it be, we'll observe that those problems that arise. And so Pentecost and the things surrounding Pentecost right after there in chapter 4 and chapter, five, chapter 2 and chapter 4 of Acts, you know some tension's coming, and a problem does arise. It arises within the church, and you can see how God brought wisdom to that church to minister through it wisely. If we lean into God, we're going to be okay, you know, because greater he who, who, who is in you is greater than the one who's in the world. We can take a solace in that. We can take comfort in that. We can walk boldly in that, that we have the help of the Lord in the church itself as a body. We have the greatest resource ever known. The one that created all the universe and everything is our advocate. This problem we're going to talk about you can see how God brought wisdom to it because as we read the first verse and the last verse of this section, it sounds pretty much the same. It's something that could have been really just disheartening. It's one that could have just really abrupted what was going on there. But verse, we're going to look at Acts uh, chapter 6, 1 through 7. And it begins in chapter 1. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, I'm thinking, wow, that's great. They are rolling. Well, in Acts 6, 7, the end of this passage, we're going to read, it says, the word of God spread and the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly. Wow, that's good also. So instead of being derailed, which could have happened, the gospel marched on and actually flourished and came out even better than the tension or the fraction that could have came into that body that just wiped it out so often. It's just, I'm disheartened many times. I see a church across town that's just taking off and doing amazing things, and then I hear just like half the attendance is there anymore. Like, what happened? Well this and this and this, or maybe sometimes a moral failure, or sometimes a, to just people in the church who are real selfish, and there was a split or split off, and, and, and just, just disheartening. Just breaks, it, and you know that the only one celebrating, that's the enemy. The Holy Spirit's grieving. The people that were at work in that church are grieving. I want to look at this, this problem as we lean into the Lord to, to know how to minister in, in today's in today's place and environment where so much tension and fractions can happen in the church we're a long time from pentecost and yet the holy spirit same holy spirit lives within you and i and our hearts and souls still moving and working in us but there's certainly tensions there's certainly been conflict there's certainly been problems and we want to be prepared to how to go about ministering in, in a way that doesn't disrupt what god wants to do through this body so let's read acts 6 1 through 6 in those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews, or the Greek Jews, amongst them complained against the Hebrew Jews because their widows were, not, were, were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect this ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from amongst you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. And we will turn this responsibility over to them. And we'll give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Procurius, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenius, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. And they presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. Now, I think if I, I, I read that to you, you're thinking, wow, is the message really, Alan, about some people not getting their food on time or you know, is this really what we're down to talking about in the church? Is this really, you know, is, is really about, and I would say, you know, a lot of times things aren't such a big deal, you know, to us and things. But I said, this is not a small problem. As, as you read about it, this would not be mentioned if this didn't threaten that Jerusalem church, the early church. It's still marching on 2,000 years later because issues like this and things were dealt with in the spirit of the Lord. But it was not, uh, you had Greek-speaking Jews that are, were in the church, and you had Hebrew Jews that were in the church. See, the Jerusalem church, even back then, had differences within the church. We have differences in the church today, all over the world. We are made up of all kinds of different races, all different kinds of ages. We're male and female. 
We're, we're young and old. We're from different societies. We have different cultures uh, that our churches all over the world are in. We see things from all different viewpoints and perspectives. And we're all the church. And the one thing we have in common is that we love the Lord Jesus because he first loved us and died on a cross for our sins and resurrected in newness of life. And that's the one thing that we hold on to and have in common. But here in the story of the church here, what you have is you have the hometown Jews. The hometown Jewish uh, from, from Israel, from Palestine already, that spoke the dialect of the Hebrew Jews. They were always from Israel. They were the ones, everybody knew what kind of pot roast or what kind of casserole they were bringing, you know, because they always brought it and people were aware of these people because they knew them and had a relationship with them. And then there was the Grecian Jews or the, the Hellenistic or Greek Jews that had a little different dialect, spoke a little differently, had a little bit different background, a little different culture that they came from. And it was kind of easy because when, when, when times get tough, when there's very little smaller resources, usually always turn inside and take care of your own. And our own, in this case, was the hometown uh, Hebrew Jews. And the Greek Jews were a little bit on the outside, a little bit on the, the fringe, a little bit of the people that say are a little bit on the outside uh, looking in a bit. And they were the ones that was a little easier, maybe not consciously, people would say we're just neglecting them, but it was happening. And, and there's some things in the church that happen unconsciously. We have to go out of our way to be a little bit more like Jesus to make sure things get done that need to be done his way. And that's what was happening here. And we can't dismiss it. Churches is ac actually split over less serious issues than this. And so we need to handle this with some seriousness and see what was happening. It was really the first, uh, the first bit of, 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 of racial tension that we have in the New Testament here. Actually, some, some things going on there was like, well, well, this is not what we want to be part of the church at all. So there's some serious things going on. But thankfully, the Lord leads this church into a wise ministry solution. And I just want to walk through those four steps uh, briefly here. And, and the first is setting priorities. First thing you can see what they did was to set priorities. It says, so the 12 gathered all the disciples together. There's an immediate response. And they said, it would, it would it not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables clear statement of priorities now whenever I read those words I always stop and ponder them a, a little bit at first glance because they seem a bit harsh I can easily imagine that certain people in this church back then said something like this hey wouldn't it be great if the apostles got together and took over the feeding of the Greek speaking widows that would send a powerful message to the congregation and it would be a healing way to bring the two groups together what could be more powerful? What could be better than the leaders to set the pace in personally solving this problem? I think it's easy, and I think it's tempting to adopt that strategy. But it would have been wrong to do so. It would have been outside of God's will for the apostles to disobey God and to start doing tables, waiting on tables, start feeding Jews. Same principle holds true for spiritual leaders in general. Any church, there's many tasks that need to be done, and it's tempting to, to say to the leadership, hey, do a little of everything. And that can lead to a spiritual disaster because when a leader does a little of everything, they end up doing a whole lot of nothing. Since the church is built upon the word of God, leaders must devote themselves to the study and teaching of the Bible, and nothing must be allowed to take the place of that central priority. That can seem neglectful. It can seem like, wow, that's out of whack. Shouldn't they be the example? Shouldn't they be out doing the yard work? Shouldn't they be mowing the lawn? Shouldn't they be, you know, like the old-time monks of centuries past that are working the land and things of the property where the parish is located? I said, really? That really wasn't God's design. So first, it's after setting priorities, you do make a plan. That's really the second step. Setting priorities is only part of the story. It's well and good for the apostles to be high-minded about their calling, but you still have a group of hungry widows out there. You still have some hungry widows that aren't fed, and they're not going to be any mood. They're not going to be in any mood to listen to what the apostles have to say about the word of God when they're still hungry. And so there had to be a plan to still handle the problem. It says, brothers and sisters, in verse 3, choose seven men from amongst you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom, and we will turn this responsibility over to them. And we'll give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. So right here, you can notice that it begins with congregational involvement. Brothers and sisters, choose seven from amongst you. It continues with a clear statement of qualifications for these people. It's not anybody and everybody. Full of the spirit and wisdom. They're looking for some very spiritually grounded people here. 
There's a commitment to definite delegation. We will turn this responsibility over to them. We're not going to just look over their shoulders or grab the steering wheel back things. We're going to turn it over to them. You know, this is the formula we use in this church. You wonder why when it comes time to, speak, to, to select deacons in this church, you write on a little candidate list, you know, that, that, to say, I'm looking at Timothy, and I'm seeing that these people are, 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 have these qualifications. They seem to be full of the spirit and wisdom, and, and, and I would follow them, and I feel like they're good servants. And so we follow the same formula in the church today. If you're wondering why we do things, we actually look at the word of God and say, that's how it's, how it's done. Empowering our deacons. To work within families and, and, and meet needs. And then they restate their priorities as, as, as the group of shepherds, as a group, group of elders there. And said, we'll give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. There's just a different amount of gifts. There's a different job description. I thought it was a great a time in the service to recognize uh, our deacons and, and deacons' wives. And so I, I know there's a, a fewer in this service, but what are deacons and deacons' wives stand up during this time? In the first service, there's like seven different uh, deacon families, and I think we have, we have three. There's all ten of them. All right, so three in this service and seven in the first. We have ten, ten deacon families, and their jobs are exactly what was in the Word of God 2,000 years ago. As they are assigned to a to hundred different families in the church, it's over half the families. We haven't got enough deacons to put a deacon over every family, but I would say, hey, I would, if you're in the church, you're saying, I'd like to make sure I'm on one of those deacons lists. I want someone praying over me and keeping in touch with me, helping me meet needs in my life. Come find us. We'll make sure you get on that list. I tried to keep each deacon down to 10 families or less because I didn't want to go beyond that because you get too overwhelmed. They'll do nothing rather than feeling like it's a job they can accomplish. But they're shepherding those families just like what these original deacons were called to do. Now, thirdly, it's about finding the right people. Verse 5, it says, this proposal pleased the whole group. Like, Why did it please the whole group? I had to get instant buy-in. Well, it says they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Procurius, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. It's like, wow, it pleased the whole group. How did they get such great buy-in so quickly with this idea? Like, they just announced it and said it pleased the whole group, the whole church. Like, I don't know anything that we've ever just submitted out to the whole church so we got instant, the whole group was pleased with it. Well, you look a little further and you look at this list of unique names. And what you'll notice if you're reading, if you knew the languages and things, these are all Greek names. Meaning that the congregation chose men from within the Greek-speaking section of the church. These men, no doubt, knew the widows personally. They would have to trust, they'd have the trust of the Greek-speaking believers and would know how to handle any problems that might arise. You know, I think that's so great. Like the, the, the church, sometimes it doesn't just always put you know, square pegs and round holes and things. There's actually the times where the church did some things that were intelligent as well as spiritually right on, but also strategic and intelligent at the same time. They got people that knew these people. They got people that were of the same group. They got people that, that knew the backgrounds of these folks. Sometimes finding the right people is what makes all the difference. The right people serving at the right time for the right reasons. And you have a fantastic formula for great things to happen. And, and, and really the final step here is they presented the men to the apostles and prayed and laid their hands on them. And so step four is they commissioned the workers. What does that mean? Well, after the congregation selected the seven, they were presented to the apostles who laid their hands on them and prayed over them. And this final step is important because it puts the full weight of the 12 apostles saying, we're behind these men and ensures that the Greek-speaking widows will, will know that they will not just be pushed to the corner. That they're not just being ignored, that they're not just being, they're being taken serious at the highest level. I think in the church it's important to note, you know, the church leadership is not going to be able to meet every need in the church. But we sure can help with systems and picking the right people and designing things to help assure that every need has a chance of getting met. The results of the steps the apostles made are spoken about in the final verse 7. It's a, it's a victorious uh, verse, great results. Instead of a, a derailment, instead of a decline, it actually springboards the church forward. And it's verse 6, 7, it says, So the word of God spread, and the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests, even the Jewish priests, became obedient to the faith. 
They were evangelistic on all levels because of how they handled this situation. Something that could have just caused all kinds of tension, something that could have caused all kinds of problems. If they continue to, you know, the, the Jews continue that we're having the problems, continue just to complain and be bitter, or hey, no one cares about me, no one's called, no one's talking to me, no one's sending me food, no one's. Instead, the leadership responded to the issue, and they, instead of in bitterness, they all were all on board, and the church marched on. Isn't that beautiful? You know, you know, remember watching the A-team when one of the guys would say, I love when a plan comes through. So this is the plan coming through. Beautiful thing. And again, like maybe last week with Esther, some of you might be saying, well, that's a great little story, Alan. And in Esther, we, we learned through the whole book of Esther that we covered last week in one message about what we could learn about ministry, and that was ministry. Know there's going to be some risks. Know there's going to be a cost. Knowing there's going to be some hard things, some hard decisions that happen in ministry. Well, I wanted you to, from this story about these deacons, from the New Testament church here, I wanted you to learn about three foundational truths that the church, both as individuals and the church, we need to know for effective ministry that I think can help us. The first one is keep the main thing the main thing. Now, you've heard that before. It's probably kind of cliche to some of you, but it's so true. The apostles understood that their calling from the Lord, was, which, is, was, which is why they refused to personally get involved in feeding, feeding the widows, seems to be harsh and uncaring, but actually is best for all of its concern. Sometimes leaders need to say no to the good in order to say yes to the best. And the church starves spiritually when their leaders lose their focus. One of the things I pray about the most, you know, just ongoing prayers and, and things in my day and stuff, one of the prayers I pray about the most is, Lord, would you guide and direct me and lead me to spend my time the best? I know that my time and, and how the Lord would lead me to use my time is multiplied. When, you, when you're a leader someplace, what you do affects all kinds of different lives. And so you want to use your time best. You've only got so much time, and you're thinking, you only got the same 24 hours everybody else has. And so how you want to use that, and will you be regretful, or are you wasting it? And so I'm very conscious as to how my time's being used. Is it being used the best? Because if you believe what so many pastors have kind of told you, that you've been saved to serve. If you believe that you were redeemed for a reason, or you were converted to a cause, and we weren't just taken right up after salvation, but we're still here, and that we have a testimony to give, then you'll know how important it is to keep the main thing the main thing. And what's the main thing? To grow and walk in your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and to share with others that same love and passion that he has for them. And Jesus summed up all the law and the prophets and everything. He said, love the Lord God with all your heart, your mind, and soul, strength. And the, the second is love your neighbors as yourself. By loving your neighbors, the most loving thing you can do is to tell them about Jesus, the salvation he has to, to give them. So I pray, Lord, how would you have you, me use my time today? Help me not to waste my time for today. And help me to keep the main thing being about you, Jesus, than anything else, not even the church. Help me to keep you the focal point of, of everything that I do today. I guess my mom, Sharon, uh, took Megan, my youngest, uh, seven-year-old now, but it was this last summertime, and mom decided to take her on the city bus, because I hadn't been on the city bus before. And they traveled around the city on the bus. And that was a, kind of the tour while Kelly and I were out of town. And uh, there was a lady that sat across from them on the bus. And um, they began a conversation that was kind of going between them, you know, as to speak on the bus and things. And, and Megan looked at her grandma, my mom, and, and said, Grandma, ask her what she knows about Jesus. If she knows anything about Jesus. And my mom says, yeah, okay, Megan, all, all right. And so a little bit while longer, Megan goes, ask her, ask her. And my mom, you know, trying to have a natural conversation where she's being pressured by her seven-year-old granddaughter about bringing up Jesus, my mom finally kind of got around to say, ask her, hey, so, you know, you have a church? You know, a church, church home somewhere? Things? You got a church background things? And Megan looks up at her and goes, that's not the question I asked you to ask. <laughs> Megan knows those are two different things. A lot of times I'll ask people, you know, oh, do your kids, your family, do they know the Lord? Oh, yeah, they know the Lord. They go to church. They've been, they, brought, they were brought up in the church. They're church people. Yeah, do they know Jesus? 
Because we got a heck of a lot of people out there that love the things of the social things of attending a church that have not ever turned their life over to Jesus. Had their sins redeemed and invited them into their life and have a personal relationship with them. There's a difference between going to church and that's just one more thing where we don't keep the main thing the main thing. This year is an election year. I say make sure you vote. But also make sure if you're looking for the biggest difference in the world, keep your expectations low and reasonable when it comes to politics. This year, people are going to spend all kinds of time getting worked up, talking, debating, campaigning for a man or a woman to be president that very soon they will likely be very disappointed in. And candidates are come and go, and nations are judged and blessed as those candidates come and go. And even nations will come and go. There's some of us in the room still think the United States of America will be around for eternity. And it's just, it's not true. We can't imagine anything else, but it's just not true. We don't know how long this country will be around. The Lord tells us what things will last forever, and it's his word and his church and God. And so don't put too much into those politic things because it's not really the main main thing. You sure want to vote. You sure want to participate in the systems that and being a, a good citizen, but you put all that election energy and fervor, if you put all that into sharing Jesus with a friend who doesn't know him, if you want to invite someone to, to church that's new this year, I'd say to use your brief time on this earth having something that can really make a difference, and those things will really make a difference. You can really take part in something that is eternal, that's life-changing, and politics is, is just not quite that. As people will ask me, Alan, who are you going to vote for? Who would you, you know? And I never tell them. I try not to say a lot about that because I don't want my name attached to every stupid and idiotic and ungodly thing that person does from that point on. They'll blame me later. Oh, <laughs> Alan voted for that guy. Like, I'm not saying. I'm going to vote for the guy, you know, that the Lord, you know, what's the least evil thing I can do by voting for this person or that person? As a parent, keeping the main thing the main thing. If you're like me, you like to teach your kids some of the hobbies or sports or the, the arts that you liked, and you want them to enjoy the things, a lot of things that you like. You know, I'm no different. And, uh, you know, I'm into athletics, and so I'm, I'm coaching two daughters right now, and every night of the week I'm out and about coaching basketball and stuff right now. And, but I know some parents that are, you know, just out there, I can, I can tell it's like college scholarship or bust. Oh, come on, you need to work harder. Get out there, come on, don't you know? And they're thinking, we're depending upon this kid. College is expensive, and so get out there and bust your rear. And by the way, have fun. You, it's all about the fun. Like, are you kidding me? You know, if, if all the things, think of all the things that you teach your kids that you're just excited about and passionate about, what are the things that are really most important? What are the things that are really, not just for this this plan, you know, what college they're going to. i got to get my kids to college. What if they don't go to college? You know, because whether a kid's flipping burgers, whether the kid's running a CEO of a company, how does that compare to whether your son has a, a, an intimate and loving relationship and a walk with Jesus Christ? There's no comparison. There's no comparison about where they're going to be and, and what's going to happen in this life and how they're going to live that life. Knowing and loving Jesus is going to change that kid's life more than anything else. What team they're on or, or, or what sports or what drama team they're on or the things that they like to do or the job they're going to have, very little difference really if, for what's really most important. So, so when we think about it, a lot of us are just convicted about that right, right then. We're like, wow, we haven't been keeping the main thing, the main thing. We were so much about this and so much about that. And, and really that's true in the church. Still 50% of Christian parents don't have a Bible study or even a spiritual conversation with their kids outside the church building. What's the main thing? First decide that. The best thing you can do as a parent is keep on sharing Jesus with your kid. Keep on having teach, keep on having times around teachable moments. Every teachable moment you get a chance. You pour in some spiritual principle or something that Jesus would say that builds them up in the Lord. And you're doing this. You'll be doing the most loving thing. 
if you can do as a parent. You got aging friends? So I spoke to a lot of the seniors the first service. I said, you got aging friends? Some of us got aging family members. And it's time to have that main thing conversation with them. It's time to have it. And it's like, oh, we don't talk about religion, religion or politics at our get-togethers, our reunions. We, we don't talk about that, Alan, because we just get in, get in trouble. Let, let me just encourage you. And you're like, well, Alan, you're pushing. Let me encourage you, and not for my sake, and not because I'm trying to manipulate you to do something you don't want to do or something you feel like is inappropriate to do in your family time. I'm trying to save you the regret and the guilt <laughs> that you will feel for a very long time if you don't have that main thing, just the main thing conversation with those loved ones. And you can have a peace that just surpasses all understandings where at least they've had the opportunity to respond to the love of Jesus because beyond a shadow of a doubt, they get a chance to know or understand what the invitation is and who the inviter is. And you can have a peace that's amazing. You know, Marvin and Maria, her mom passed this last week and she was 94 years old. And she's another buzzer beater because she just came to know Jesus like two years ago. And Maria has just been, you know, cloud nine ever since a lot because that was just, that decision was finally made. And she's going to see her mom again in glory. And it changes the whole perspective of those people while they're here. And it changes the perspective of the people that have to do the funeral afterwards. Maria's mom was approached recently. A lady came over to her house from the, the, the mobile home park, the manufactured park that they lived in, and said, oh, Wow, you know, I just feel so, I'm going to pray that God heals you. And she promptly responded, oh, no, you don't. No, don't pray for him. I want to go be with Jesus. Don't you dare pray that I stay here longer than I have to for healing. What a difference. Knowing what the main thing and keeping the main thing as the main thing in everything. Now, the second thing, foundational for ministry that you can see from this passage of scripture is that no one can do everything. And some of you are saying, well, that, that's duh. Or the, um, but this, follow, this follows logically. The apostles couldn't do their work and feed the widows too. The same is true in every church today. The shepherds can't do it all. Deacons and pastoral staff can't do it all. The local church uh, can't, it has hundreds of things that need to be done, and therefore hundreds of willing hands are needed. As a pastor, I can preach, I can cast a vision, I can pray. I can even do a midweek journey group, but I can't lead in the nursery. I can't lead the children's and youth and college programs. I can't play an instrument very well. I can't lead Sunday morning discovery group anymore because we have the services. The same now we have two Bible study times Sunday morning call them discovery groups, and I can't lead one because now I'm preaching both hours. I used to be able to do that. I can't even do that. I can't make all the hospital visits that are necessary. I can't even make a dent in all the home visits. The people who really would need need a visit. Jim came to my office, our, our uh, evangelism coordinator, and he was fired up about evangelism. And he's got a great vision. He's going to go to the vision retreat this next week. He wants three teams of 15, 45 people involved that are willing to go out and just visit someone who's come to our church and, and, and talk to them and find out where they are and what their background is and maybe get a chance to ask the faith question on what in your personal opinion it takes for a person to go to heaven. But he wants 45 people, but he only wants you to, you only have to come once a month for that Sunday afternoon because he's going to want to get so many people, a platform of so many people across our, our church that you just go once a month, a part of a 15-person team, three different weeks, and you only go once. And the other last week is off. I said, that's a great idea, Jim. And I'm not able to coordinate all that, but I sure appreciate that. I love that idea. Let's start signing people up. I'm not able to manage our website. Todd built a great website, one of our shepherds, and stays on top of it. I hear now Hazel Winland is getting involved in that. What a great ministry. What an important uh, realm of information and communication happening because of those people. I didn't have time to build a playground, but we had... Uh, craftsmen in our church able to build a playground that I'm not able to do and you wouldn't want me to do. Didn't able to do a parking lot, but Paul and Kevin and Marvin, they said we can put that together, we can build that. There are a lot of people to do that and do things around the church and we're blessed by. I had some mentors that came and talked to me, some pastor mentors a few years back and they gave me some priceless advice. 
They said, Alan, don't try and do anything in your church that somebody else can do. Don't try and do anything in your church that somebody else can do. And I thought, well, that's a lot. <laughs> Basically, all well, the church got about everything covered that I can do. They said, that's great. Then oversee it. I was like, well, I think I, I still ought to preach. And they, oh, yeah, yeah, you're, you're the vision caster. You need to preach a certain amount of time to continue leading that church. But everybody else can do just about everything I can do. They say, most pastors only have the giftedness to do about 40% of the church's work that needs to be done. They only have even the giftedness of doing those things. Church at its best knows that no one can do everything. Scripturally, 1 Corinthians 12, if you're familiar with that, talks about how the church body is really like the human body. And the foot can't say to the eye, I don't need you. And the ear can't say to the hand, I don't need you. And you can't, I mean, because the whole body, you think of how you would operate without a finger, how, how you, without a toe, without an intestine, without you know, stomach, without a part of your mouth. Think of how you would deal with any of that. And, and you can't. Let me read from 12, Romans 12, 6 through 8, where Paul says, We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it's serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, then do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, then do it cheerfully. You can hear Paul's heart. You can hear him admonishing the church not just to discover your gifts, discover your heart, your ministry, your experience. Just not to discover that stuff, but to use it. It's not a gift. It's not a ministry until you use it, until you get involved. Use them for God's kingdom. Really leads finally to this last point. That everyone can do something. No one should do everything, but everyone can do something. This is the flip side of what I've just said. Think about our text. In the beginning, the widows are going hungry. Their friends are upset. Anger is threatening the very unity of the church. But by the end, anger is gone. The widows are fed because the seven men are now serving the Lord and are recognized by the entire congregation. And it's precisely how the body is supposed to function. Beautifully. 1 Peter 4.10 says, Each one of you should use whatever gift you've received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Do you want to be a faithful manager? A faithful steward of all the gifts, of all the heart stuff, of all the passions that God has given you and placed in you. Do you want to be a faithful steward of that? I have one pause in all this. Because you should ask God, how do you want me to serve? You've made me, and, if, and you say, God kind of brings things that you enjoy to your mind. And that's good. And say, well, God, how do you want me to serve? And God brings feedback that you've gotten about how effective you are in certain ways. And when you find something that you enjoy and you find something you're effective at, that you get feedback like, hey, this is you. You're great at this. Good chance that is how God gifted you. He likes you to serve in your rev zones. He likes you to serve in a place you're going to enjoy because you'll, you'll serve with more passion. You'll serve with more energy. And so you're exactly where you should be. When you're serving, you, you'll, you'll, have, you'll come to a point where you serve somewhere in the church and you'll notice you feel like you're not doing much. And, and other people will say, man, thank you for doing this. And you're like, wow, it was just so natural to me. It was so enjoyable. I didn't know I was serving. That old saying about find a job or a position you love and you'll never work a day in your life, it's, it's true with the Lord. It's true in the church. But here, here's the pause. And I, I've been more, most passionate about so many different types of ministries over the years. And you know when you're passionate about something? You can't for the life of you understand how others are not as passionate about the same ministry or opportunities as you are. Because you're passionate about it. So you're like, why are these other people not passionate about it either? Why aren't they moving? Why aren't they taking part in what I'm doing? Because this is the best. This is the greatest. I'm having so much fun. I'm feeling like these people are left out. I remember feeling like that as a campus minister for years. You know, I, There was years that I had 10 volunteers on staff. And there was years I had four volunteers on staff. And I could, I was baffled in the down years. I was like, why aren't people trying to knock down the doors to work with teenagers? Where are they? I went to a fellowship of Christian athletes retreat for several years, each year with a, a man named George that was leading that ministry. And I remember one year, he, he said, I had three leaders cancel last minute. None of them are, are coming. And I, and I was just baffled at the time. I was like, 
man, someone must have died or something to bail on this. This is the best weekend of the year. He's like, well, I know who my friends are, you know, now. And I was like, I didn't, I didn't think that way at all. I thought, wow, these people just, they lost an opportunity to have so much fun. We would play all these mud games on this big field, and we would go up to the hot springs and sit at the hot springs at Belknap and go, you know, we would just do so many fun, huge athletic games. It was just right in my passion zone. I was like, wow, this is great. For a while, I did Mexico mission trips, one after another down to Mexico, and I was in the missions, and I wanted everybody to be in missions. It's like, how come everybody's not signing up to go on a missions trip? Don't they know going to Mexico is a journey? Don't they know it's exciting? Don't they know it's fun going across the border? And you always take risks, and you don't know exactly what's going to happen. And, and you come back, and the kids are just so much others-minded, and they've seen you know, other places around the world sometimes live, and they're just better for it, and they're more ministry-minded. Everybody ought to go on one of these trips. And start getting some frustration as why other people wouldn't go, or didn't want to go, or didn't even need to go. And I would say if we're not careful, we can get frustrated that not everybody is passionate about the same ministry I'm passionate about. And I would say even, to be fair, our passions and our hearts even change. Things I used to be passionate about, my passions have changed them. I've moved into some different areas. And that's okay. That's okay for you. It's okay for me. I remember, you know, as a campus life director, I, I'd go on these trips, we'd go to amusement parks and things, and my goal in the early years was to never turn down a roller coaster invitation from non-Christian kids. I was like, I'm going to go, you know, and so I'm just dizzy by the end of the day, you know, just going on one roller coaster, my stomach is feeling queasy, I feel like I can throw up the rest of the evening, but doggone it, I'm going with these non-Christian kids because that evening I know we're presenting the gospel and I want some relationship time built before it, and we've been sleeping on gym floors, you don't sleep at all, you're tired, and I recognize when my passions had changed, when I was a little different, when I went to Disneyland the eighth year in a row, and I told my wife about this when I went, got home. I said, babe, I was in Disneyland, and the kids were all going different directions, and uh, I hadn't slept very well the night before, and I found the Pirates of the Caribbean uh, ride at Disneyland, and they have a restaurant right off of it. That has a, it's dark, and it's cool in there, and there's some booths. And I found a booth in there, and I laid down and fell asleep, and I was asleep there the next three hours. Yeah. And I told her about that, and then I, I got home from the trip. I said, I think I'm done. Like, I, I, don't, know if I, could, I don't know if I'm doing this anymore. I just, and I don't know if my heart even, even wants to. And, and, and years before, I would have been telling myself, you're crazy. We're going to Disneyland again. We're going to talk to the people about the Lord. We're going to Magic Mountain after that. And we're going to Catalina Island. We're going to... But man, I, just, I, don't, I don't think so. I think I'm done. And, and if I was like my old self and that, you know, I would have judged myself and think, man, what's wrong with you? And so I think everybody needs to serve in a ministry doing something, but not the same thing. Everybody needs to serve in a ministry doing something, but not the same thing. And that's the beautiful d design of, of God that he's made us all different and given us different gifts and different ministries and different passions and different experiences that he's prepared us for that. And, and as Christians, we still, we can just kind of well up with such judgmental because we don't know why the person's not making it to help with the building or we don't know why the person's not making it to study again, but we don't know all the things they're doing outside and they're praying, they're leading a person to the Lord at work and they're not making it to the meeting again because they're out there serving this elderly lady that they're praying for and leading and, and we can just become so judgmental. And you know what? The Bible knew that about us 2,000 years ago. Listen to what Paul says on this subject in Romans 12, 3 through 5. It's a little earlier of the verses I read. For by grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment. Think critically on this. In accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, by many members. And these members do not all have the same function. So in Christ, same as the body, so in Christ, though many, many parts of it, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. If you have the understanding and maturity and when it comes to ministry to understand that man, people have different passions, different are just different, they're made different. And it can just be a, 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 a point of dissension. It can be a point of 
distrust, can be a point of, of, of being disappointed with others. And the Bible is just really clear, like, don't do that. Know that, it, know that nobody, you know, can try and do everything. Sometimes we have one person doing 100 things around the church, and that's unhealthy. It would be a lot healthier to have 100 people doing one thing. But it's also health, unhealthy when you have maybe 50% of the people doing nothing. They're not doing the one thing. So everybody could do something, but not all the same thing. The Lord, and the, through the word of God, is so wise. The Bible is so wise. It gives us the freedom to really serve and administer. And it gives us the wisdom to it. And, and I'm so thankful God just ordained. God kept these manuscripts. God kept this history here from the early church in Acts to give us such wisdom as how we can be the church today. The invitation is this, is for those that, for those that don't know the Lord, I know this is not an evangelical sermon, but for those who don't yet have a relationship with Jesus, he invites you to have a relationship with him. And he says, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, Jesus is Lord, and that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. He gives us that opportunity to be saved, to, to be baptized into his family.